So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the Renaissance and we're going back to Nevada. So hey y'all, welcome. This is gonna be another little chat. I'm sitting down here. I have this puka uh, licorice tea, which is one of the teas that I got back last uh, last winter. I guess it was last winter when I was doing the cleanse, whatever. And you know, things are happening, whatever. But um, so I wanna, you know, as we continue this conversation around the Constitution and how you know folks are all fired up around the Constitution when there may not be a very deep understanding of what the Constitution means, I wanted to give a little bit of thought to also the social moment that we are in when we're talking about the Constitution and the idea that the Constitution was born out of the Renaissance and a lot of these ideas that were emerging in uh, the society, right? Especially in Western society, where we're, you know, you know, breaking out of this religion-based, strict, thinking and really starting to get into a more open and critical mindset especially around the nature of being a human being in fact the one of the um the idea of humanism is kind of born out of the renaissance and so um we have people reinvesting and starting to revisit the sciences, right? Which, you know, many people think of them as coming out of ancient Greece, but those of us who have, you know, delved a little bit more into history know that the Greeks were actually getting these things from the Middle East and from Africa. And so we're starting to reinvest in the sciences and the arts, and these are all, um, you know, part of this kind of wonderful reinvestment of the idea of, you know, individuals, all of individuals being seen as free and equal. All of us are free and equal in, 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 in the eyes of society. But however, w at the same time that we see this emergence um, and this growth of the idea of all of us are these, uh, as these moral, rational beings deserving of dignity, we also see a rise in imperialism, specifically coming out of the West. And we have these violent campaigns that are happening all over the world. So even in, you know, uh, you know, this is all happening up through the time that we see the drafting of the Constitution, right? Whose ideas, the very words that are uh, exist in the Bill of Rights can tie tie all the way back to the Magna Carta from the from the 13th century, right? Where individuals were saying that we have basic uh, human rights and they're demanding them from King John, right? And so we also saw the, you know, the Magna Carta being kind of completely um, dismissed by the church. But we see these same ideas in the Constitution, and while the Constitution is being penned, we have this violent exploitation of the majority of the citizens. Um, and by the majority of the citizens, we're including, um, as I talked about in my last video, in when I discussed the preamble to the Constitution, that only 50% of white men at the time were even given the right to vote on whether the Constitution was going to be ratified, not to mention the rights that, well, the lack of rights that we see um, for women and for, you know, black people in the society. And so this idea of our ideology not matching up with our practice is one that starts at the very foundation of the birth of these amazing ideas about the dignity of all of us. Which brings me um, to the conversation that we're going to have about Nevada today, um, which links directly to certain promises that are made by the society to the members of that society, but promises that are not kept to that society. And I owe some of this discussion today, the content of this discussion today, to Bruce Webb, who left several links 
on my video from a few videos ago last week, um, and two of them were from Richard Wolf, uh, Richard D. Wolf, who's an economist. And if you don't know about Richard Wolf, you should def definitely check out um, Richard Wolf. But in uh, one of the videos in particular, um, Richard Wolf is talking to Dr. Harriet Fraud. And in this discussion, there's a linking of the economy to psychology, but specifically looking at this idea of mass attacks, these attacks by armed assailants on huge groups of people. In the United States, we have these formal and informal agreements that have been made. And when we talk about informally, we're talking specifically about agreements that were made with members of white society and looking at the privileges of white society that were promised right, to maintain a certain level of social order. And that rhetoric is around also male, maleness, uh, that, that promise is also around hard work and the rewards of hard work. And just generally speaking, um, they paint this picture of what's been called the American dream. And so when we look at Nevada and the question of whether of, uh, of whether what happened in Nevada was a political act. When we look at it in terms of a particular promise that has been made to a certain segment of the population and what that segment of the population's response has been and how these mass attacks might be the manifesta manifestation of unrest that is being experienced by the certain segment of the population, we can start to look at these things as political actions. Um, in the United States, we have seen a rise in these mass attacks since the 80s. And in the conversation with Harriet Fraud, Harriet Fraud, um, links this specifically to something that was happening in terms of the economy, and that was specifically Ronald Reagan becoming president and making one of his first political actions, the breaking up of the unions. It started with the, um, I believe it was the Air Traffic Controllers Union that we saw going on strike and Ronald Reagan basically stepping in and saying, hey, we're gonna fire, fire you if you don't go back to work, which was in some ways an act that might have been considered unconstitutional. But we see the slow dismantling of the unions over the next three decades. And with the dismantling of the unions, um, we also see automation and we also see the moving of a lot of the jobs that were once union jobs overseas. And those are jobs that are primarily the jobs of white men and had historically been and traditionally been jobs of white men. Now, whatever you might want to say in terms of racism, it certainly is. Um, it certainly does mean that we have a group that is being targeted by uh, specific political action that is being taken in a society. So we see basically white men under fire of the state. Now, at the same time, as we see this dismantling of the American dream, we start to see these mass attacks. And uh, they start in post offices. In fact, uh, a large number of them have happened in post offices. In fact, the term going postal comes from the fact that these are where these attacks, at least in the consciousness of, of uh, people in the United States, this is how they kind of came into our consciousness. And I remember in the 80s seeing these things starting to hit the, the headlines when I was, you know, you know, I was a kid, but starting to see these things hit the headlines and these things starting to become normalized as a part of our experience in our society that people went postal. And there's actually a book called um, 
going postal, uh, which addresses this. And Mark Ames is the author of that book. So um, Mark Ames going postal addresses this idea. And so you have the slow dismantling of the American dream. You have the main target of this particular type of economic violence being um, white men who are a majority of the workforce. So it's a huge segment of the population. Um, and they're essentially being dethroned. And what do I mean by being dethroned? So you have at one time in the society, there was a guarantee that you would go to high school, you would graduate, you would get a good job. You would get a job where you could support your family. And this is without even going to college, right? The expectation you were gonna graduate from high school, get a good job, likely a union job that was high paying. You could support your family. Um, and you were seen as the breadwinner. You were seen as the king of the castle. And this image of men in the society is still being maintained to this day, is still being maintained, but it is one that no longer do we see the white men in the society being able to live up to, right? So there's been a, a huge fracture between what is the ideology and what is the expectation of males in general, but white men specifically, um, and this being um, deeply disappointed in the society not being able to live up to society's expectations, not being able to be, you know, we have the image of the, you know, strong male, John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Bruce Willis, right? So with this group being socialized and conditioned to behave and respond in a very uh, particular way, this group is not even, uh, even, even equipped to deal with this situation, with this with this huge social injustice. This is a group who since the beginning hasn't seen themselves targeted in this specific way, targeted almost because of their identity as white men. So we have white men being targeted by the society with no way to respond because we have, you know, we don't have, you know, men organized around their maleness in the way that women are organized around their femaleness with feminism, right? And we don't have a kind of a civil rights movement for white men. We don't have any of the mechanisms for men to deal with what's been happening to them in the society. And so... On the other side of that, on the other side of that, we see that the message being sent to these men is that the reason for this failure, which is not an individual failure, it's a societal failure. But the reason that this group is being given is that it's because women are taking all the jobs and because people of color are taking all of the jobs, it's affirmative, it's because of affirmative action. That's why you suddenly don't have a job working when you were working in a factory that closed down and jobs were sent overseas. But the fact that you don't have a job today is because women have taken the jobs, that uh, people of minorities have taken the jobs, uh, that immigrants have taken all the jobs, right? It's not being uh, expressed in the reality, which is that it is a failure of capitalism to be able to live up to its promise. And so you have a group of individuals in the society who are feeling even more targeted now because not only do we have a, a concrete, a material, a material reality that is being experienced by these individuals, they're being lied to about the causes of that reality. And so when we look at Nevada, is Nevada what can be considered a random act? when we see that the group who is mostly involved in these acts, say by far the majority of these attacks are perpetrated by men and by white men. Can we not see that as a group that is unified around political aims and that is to see the restoration of their place in society? And I don't mean that to say that, you know, somehow that, you know, white men are evil or white men are corrupt, but there certainly is a connecting theme when you look at the individuals who, who perpetrate these acts. We also have to look at the idea that this behavior has been collectively normalized. So the normalization of this behavior is happening on a societal level, even though we look at it as horrible, 
it has become part of our experience. And we haven't necessarily taken any of the steps to change things. We just see it as, you know, these things that happen sometime, right? These, uh, these, you know, we, and, and there's, and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the language that we use to talk about them. So even the fact that, um, you know, there are certain mechanisms that made it possible, that make it possible for these individuals to, um, to do these things, right? So the, the access that they have, right? The places that the access that they have to the places that they go where they take place, the access that they have to the particular items that they use to commit these acts, all of these things are, you know, politically based, right? These are based on collective decisions about who is going to have access to what. Um, we also see that um, the way that we address these, we the failure to address the root causes is also something that is uh, politically motivated or shows at least a collective lack of political will. So all of these things are happening on a political level, right? The fact that these things can happen, the fact that these things do happen can all be traced back to the political and the collective decisions that have been made in this particular society. And so then we talk about the language that we use to talk about them. We talk about them, we say that these are evil individuals. This is just evil. And our use of that word, which is been, it becomes, it's become the euphemism. It's become the default language that we use to talk about these, about these acts, when in fact it is a euphemism. And it's a euphemism for the collective outrage of a specific group. And it is a specific group who seems to be uh, the, the main perpetrators of this type of a crime, right? It's a response to a broken promise that was made by society to a specific group. It's also made to the society in general, but there is a specific group who is particularly injured when that promise is being broken. So to, to see it as not a political act, I think, denies a lot of the components that go into making these acts possible and might be going into motivating these acts. We also have to look at the fact that as a society, we have collectively bought into the promise that was made. We've bought collectively into this idea of white supremacy, especially in the way that it maintains a certain level of, of peace within the society. So when we have um, this experience of privilege that's happening in the society of the white American male, women benefit from that in the security of that home that's being created, although it might not, it might be in some ways against the will of those particular women, there is a benefit that women feel from the security that is gained through the maintenance of a promise of white supremacy. Even minorities benefit from a certain level of peace that is experienced, or at least the lack of targeting that happens when there is a certain stability within the society. And there's the idea that, you know, occasionally there are going to be women, occasionally there are going to be people, regardless of your, you know, background, whether you're gay, whether you're whoever you are, you're going to be able to benefit from that system being maintained in place. So with the crumbling of that system, we're all in some ways a little bit culpable because we've helped to maintain that system to begin with. And if this were not the case, why is it that we see even now so many people working to maintain the status quo? A status quo that, again, makes these types of events even possible to begin with. At least that's what, that, that's what I'm thinking about these days. Um, I certainly would like to know what all of you think. Um, but that's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourselves. Peace. And I love myself.